Good evening. We are at the Jacob Edwards Library in Southbridge um, this Thursday evening, and we have a guest speaker this evening who I'm very pleased to introduce. Her name is Dr. Beth O'Leary Onish, and she's here to present uh, some t some uh, a talk on her book, which is the Irish American Fiction from World War II to JFK. Uh, some of our audience will be familiar with uh, Dr. O'Leary Anish and her work as she has presented previously at the Jacob Edwards Library, mostly around St. Patrick's Day for <laughs> obvious reasons and with her topic. And um, it is our great pleasure this evening to have her back to talk from her book, which um, I think we have a copy of. May I just show it on camera, sure. please? Thank you. So here is the cover of the book, and I hope you agree. Um, I think it's a wonderful illustration <laughs> to introduce such a topic. And thank you, Beth. You're welcome. This copy, or not this one, but um, we have a copy of the book as well at the Jacob Edwards Library for anybody who'd be interested in following up after the talk, which I'm sure there will be people who will be <laughs> interested. So thank you for joining us this evening. We have uh, an audience here as well. So um, we are ready to start. So I please give Southbridge a welcome for Dr. Beth O'Leary Anish. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Margaret, and thanks for having me back. It's, it's always lovely to come to the Jacob Edwards Library where you have such a beautiful space here and um, it, folks who are interested in all sorts of literature, including, I found out, Irish American literature, which is my, my area of expertise. Um, as, as Margaret mentioned, I did just publish uh, my first book, Irish American Fiction from World War II to JFK. And you have the cover there. The cover is actually the uh, Boston Famine Memorial, if anybody's been um, to Boston to see that. It's one, one part of the statue. Um, the other part has the, the immigrants coming off, off the boat, basically, um, uh, in rough shape from, from the famine. And this is the representation of Irish Americans um, on the rise and, and trying to, to make good here in their new country, which is a big part of the story of Irish America and part of the story that I've, I've talked about before. Um, this book, let's see, a little bit about uh, the book. It's out from Palgrave Macmillan, I should say, and was just published last month, December of 2021. Uh, it's based on research that I put together while doing my dissertation at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, but after the dissertation and after graduating with the, the PhD, I looked back at what I had. I wanted to publish a book, but I wasn't sure exactly how to go about um, figuring out what I wanted to say. Was it the whole dissertation? I decided it really wasn't. It was this specific time period of just after World War II uh, that really kept drawing me back to it. And I had two authors in the original dissertation from that time period. I have now have, I have seven in the book, so I've really honed in on and zeroed in on that particular um, time, whereas the, the dissertation spanned um, about the 1940s to about 2010. So I really zeroed in on 1940s to about 1960 in this book. And a lot of people don't know um, most of these books. They're, they're regional fiction, they're novels that kind of were, were popular at the time and then faded uh, from, from most people's knowledge. So I'm trying to bring some of them back to people's attention because they're fabulous books um, that I'm writing about. So I write about literature <laughs> and specifically about Irish American literature and what it can tell us, especially literature from that time period, about how Irish American identity has developed over the, the decades and centuries even and uh, where, we are, where we are now and where we were then. Um, so this book covers seven novels. Um, all, like I said, uh, six of them actually are Irish American novelists and one of them is claimed to be, or most people assume it is, about Irish America and it is in part about that. Before I get into that, just this, this is a little bit of the history that I talked about when I was here before, but just to fill it in uh, quickly for, for folks. Um, 
who may be hearing this for the first time. The Irish American population was changing greatly by the 1940s, so that's the reason I'm interested in this period. It's a real turning point. Um, immigration from Ireland slowed after um, legislation restricted immigration in the 1920s. Uh, so previous to that, there had been, as you probably all know, um, large waves of Irish immigrants coming in from the 1840s uh, into uh, around and about 1900, 1910s. But things slowed way down between the restricted immigration policies and um, the Great Depression, two world wars, uh, and then, um, let's see, yeah, the, the, on the slide there you have the, how sharply the decline was from 220,000 plus in the 1920s of Irish immigrants to um, about 26,000 in the, the 1940s. So the, the outcome of that is that neighborhoods that were uh, full at the turn of the century of, of Irish immigrants and their children, uh, so first and second generation Irish Americans, um, were, were aging out. You know, the, the, certainly the immigrants from the end of the 19th century were passing away at this point. And so authors, all of my authors were born in the first two decades of, of the 20th century. And they were born into a time that was in their neighborhoods, in those neighborhoods that sprung up around Catholic, Irish Catholic churches. They were used to a very vibrant Irish cultural concentrated uh, neighborhood. By the 1940s, that's all changing. And this is particularly in the, the northeastern US where those urban neighborhoods mostly happen. Um, 1940s, you've got uh, soldiers coming home from World War II. They've got the GI Bill. They've got some upward mobility maybe for, um, maybe for the first time for some of their families. They start to move out. They're given, um, they're encouraged with federal loans to move out to the suburbs and to establish uh, themselves there. So those concentrated neighborhoods um, start to disappear or, or at least disperse. That's the time that my authors are writing. And they're writing with concern about what that means to, to not have this uh, Irish community right around them anymore. What does it mean to be Irish American three or four generations in? So that's what these, these books tackle. Um, and I'll just skip on from there. So same time, we've got uh, tensions in Irish America, kind of the direction Irish Americans are headed. And there's never just one direction. Of course, there's all different people in every culture, right? Um, but you've got a, a real tension in all of these books that I will um, show you as we go through these slides between the Irish Americans who are um, very much concerned about the, the working people and the working poor. They're very active in the labor movement. Um, they are more likely uh, to be more open to other oppressed groups as well. Um, and then you've got kind of the more conservative strain who are more likely to want to hang on to what, what they've gained by this time in the US. Uh, they want to protect the property that they've, that they've got. And they start to turn towards the same kind of fear and bigotry that was directed at their ancestors a generation, two generations earlier. All the authors in my book <laughs> are on the left side of that spectrum and, and are kind of warning their peers and, and others about what, what's happening. Like, how are we losing this? What they look back on as a very um, generous and warm, welcoming community and not one who would turn their backs on other new folks coming in because they remember being the new folks who were coming in. Um, so this, the two strains, I mean, you see it today. 
two. There's, there's two, I mean, I'm sure there's some gray areas in between, but there are these conservative and, and more liberal voices um, in Irish America still, which is something that I get to by the end of my book. Um, all these books taken together um, are, are really a call for social justice. They, as I was expressing, kind of said some of this, they are anxious about what's being lost. Um, and what's being lost, you get from a lot of the elderly characters in the novels, the, the, especially grandfathers for some reason come up again and again as they're the Irish immigrant character. They are usually pro-labor, pro-worker. They are um, lecturing their younger family members about, you know, we were the poor people coming in once. We were the oppressed coming in once. Don't forget who we were. Um, so this trope comes up again and again in the novels. So my theory is, my argument is, that these novelists are trying to get that back, or they're at least very anxious about where it went or where it's going, where Irish America is heading, if they turn away from those kind of um, more humble roots. Okay. Uh, so I just mentioned the, the elder, the grandfather or father. Sometimes it's an uncle. Um, sometimes it's a mother, but it's very often for some reason the, the, uh, the grandfather, especially. Um, so they're the ones representing this generation that's, that's dying out, which I've pretty much said there. OK, so actually, I'll just I'll stay on this slide for, for a moment. Just, um, so the, the subtitle of my book is Anxiety, Assimilation, and Activism. And I just want to hit on those three things for a minute. You've got that anxiety that I just expressed about uh, what's happening to Irish America? What are we becoming? Uh, and you've got the assimilation because that's the process that's happening. The Irish, a couple generations in, are, are obviously becoming um, Americans as as they, especially as they mix in with other um, Americans and are influenced by folks outside those concentrated neighborhoods. And then you've got the activism, which is that. Um, both labor union activism and just a call for, for justice very often in these books. Uh, my book, I think, exists, too, in three time periods. It's the time period of the author's childhoods that they're calling back to in these novels. And then it's the time period when they're writing the books, that 1940s to, to 1960 time frame where they've seen their neighborhoods start to disperse and they're, they're worrying about what's happening to it. And then the present day when I'm writing it and reflecting back on all this, and I do think these novels that are in the book have a lot to say about where we are and um, politically, <laughs> uh, and they could really, it'd be great for more people to be able to read them. There are only a few that are still um, in print, and I'll talk about which, which those are. But you can still find them uh, used on Amazon. That's how I found them all. Uh, from, you can tell they're you know, originals from the 1940s. They're out there. So let's see. OK. OK. So uh, one other person I want to talk about before I get to the slides that are the the books themselves, is uh, there's a man named John V. Kelleher, who was a professor at Harvard, a professor of Celtic studies at Harvard. And he was about the same age as all of these authors. And in 1947, he wrote this great essay called Irish American Literature and Why There Isn't Any. <laughs> and he basically said, there's no tradition of Irish American literature. Nobody has written the great Irish American novel that tells from start to finish the story of the immigrants in the 19th century through what Irish America has become by the 1940s. 
his essay seems to cover a lot of the same concerns that these novelists have. They're just writing in fiction, and he's writing in essay form. Uh, now, he's good friends with one of the authors I cover, who's um, Edwin O'Connor. They grew up in similar neighborhoods in different states. O'Connor was from Woonsocket in Rhode Island, and um, Kelleher was from Lawrence, Massachusetts. So probably similar to Southbridge, too. They grew up in towns that were industrial towns, and they had concentrated ethnic neighborhoods that they came out of. Um, they knew the same kind of people, had the same kind of humor, um, same kind of uh, nicknames for all the guys in the neighborhood and all of that. So it's funny to me that, or maybe it it's makes sense, that O'Connor ends up probably writing the novel, uh, The Last Hurrah, which is mostly answers Kelleher's concerns. And I'll get to that novel in a minute. Um, OK. I'll read just a couple things from the book. One from my preface, which talks about why I chose this time period, um, which really, when I started going back into it, like I said, after figuring out what I wanted to publish out of the dissertation, I realized I was writing about my parents. My parents graduated from high school in, uh, let's see, 41 and 44. So they were World War II era um, young people. They had lived through the Depression as kids. Um, my mother's high school yearbook, most of the boys' pictures are blank or they're in uniform because they're already off in World War II. And so I just kept coming back to this, and I think, I think that's why. Um, so my parents' generation was not far displaced from generations of Irish Americans who faced discrimination in employment in the United States. My mother remembered her uncle being passed over for a promotion at the mill where he worked because he was Catholic. My father's parents decided not to name him after Irish hero Robert Emmett for fear of discrimination he would face when he was born in 1922. He was named Robert Edward instead. Now I know that he was also born just after one Red Scare and was a young man about to get married and start a family during another. It's not just in my family that the legacy of discriminatory treatment still appeared well into the 20th century, though there have always been Catholics rallying for the cause of the poor and disenfranchised Many realized that involvement with a radical social movement would only undermine the acceptance the Irish in the United States had worked so hard to achieve. They also had the church hierarchy warning them about the evils of communism. This is a, my, uh, it's a transgenerational legacy of the fear of rejection combined with the fear that radicals were out to bring down the church. The roots of these fears had been largely forgotten by the time I came of age late in the 20th century, but there they were. Um, still haunting my father at the beginning of the 21st. I skipped over a little story where um, I teach lots of different literary theory. I teach intro to literature and other literature classes. And one of the theories that we teach is Marxist literary theory. It doesn't mean I'm a communist or that I'm trying to make my students communists, but my father took it that way and, and yelled at me, that's bad. Uh, you can't teach that. So <laughs> I... I as I started doing all this reading on this time period, I'm like, oh, geez, he, you know, this is how, this is what he was brought up with very strong feelings about that. Um, anyhow, further on into my introduction, I talk more about, I set up really the, the book with the history of Irish America, which I've talked to you quite a bit about already. Um, as well as studies on memory, social memory, how, how our memories are formed in community. Um, there's a, a Maurice Halvox is a theorist who talks about that. So we remember things together. And if you think about it, like if you talk to your siblings or friends you grew up with about, about things that happened, you're all going to have a slightly different take maybe on on what happens. So we remember best when we're together with other people who experience things with us, so in community. And then another um, 
theorist of, of memory studies, Paul Ricoeur, talks about how memories are tied to places. So he says there's no, it's not a coincidence that we say when something happened that it took place. So like your neighborhood where you grew up, there's a reason that your memories are so strong of that place, right? And if you think about it, um, for an immigrant community, they've left one community already uh, in Ireland or wherever they're from. Here in the US, at the time I'm writing about, they're now leaving those neighborhoods too. So it's gotta be a kind of disorienting feeling to leave your memory places and the people you share the memories with behind. Um, this drives some of the anxiety, I think, that you find in this book. Another theorist I talked about was actually an Italian-American scholar, and, uh, Edvige Gianta, and she talks about class migration. When folks move out of the working class into the middle class, how it's really difficult for them to go back. Um, they can't quite go back. They're not quite the same person. And I think that carries over certainly into the Irish American fiction as well. Um, when we have gaps in the memories that we no longer share within um, our communities, we fill in those gaps with imagination often. So we start to fill in... <laughs> generations in to, to this country, we make our own traditions, right? St. Patrick's Day celebrated here. I'm sure Margaret can attest was very different probably from the way you celebrated St. Patrick's Day uh, years ago at home. I'm sure the American tourist industry has influenced that quite a bit. Um, corned beef and cabbage too, from what I'm told. Not a thing over there, but a big thing here. So it, it we fill in what we don't remember with, with really new, new traditions um, to the point where one of the things that got me thinking about all this, like how did we get here? My students, if I talk about Irish anything, I say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm Irish. You should see how much my family drinks. <laughs> you should see how much we drink on St. Patrick's Day. And I'm like, oh. You've taken the worst of the, the stereotypes and the things that were hurled against um, Irish people coming into the country and you're just embracing them and um, making them your own, internalized racism, really, uh, in a way. So all of this factors into what these questions are that my authors are, are kind of answering with their books and, and what they're trying to, to do with them. Uh, Okay, so let me finally get to the books because that's really what I'm writing about here. But I had to set up both the book and this talk with, with some of that. Uh, so if you know any of these books, you may know A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. This is one of the two, I think, in the whole thing that probably are still in print um, and, and easily readily available. Betty Smith, though, is the, the author that I said she actually isn't uh, of Irish descent. Uh, she did have an Irish stepfather. Her, when her father passed away, her mother married an Irish immigrant. So she certainly knows, and she did grow up in Brooklyn, where, where the book is obviously set. Um, my theory on this book, it's a little troubling, because going back to that stereotype of the Irish drunk, especially um, the father in this book, uh, Johnny Nolan, is an alcoholic who pretty much brings down his whole family. The, the, the family's, any chance that the family has, he is um, responsible for <laughs> eliminating. And he's, he's charming, and he's handsome, and he sings beautifully, and he tells stories, but um, his primary characteristic is, is that he's, he's drunk. And not only that, the bigger problem I have with it is it's, it's not just a personal issue for Johnny. It's seen as a failing of his whole family, basically genetic, that, his, um, that alcoholism and, and wild ways, the gambling, alcoholism, wildness run in the family, and that the men in the family all die young because of these traits. 
So essentially, the Nolans are dying out because of these inherent traits, which are problematic <laughs> to me. Um, the other thing, the Irish grandparents, all we know about them in this book are that they came over at the time of the potato, potato famine. We don't know anything else about them except for the wildness of the, the whole family. The mother's side, the, the, so the protagonist is Francie uh, Nolan. Her mother is the daughter of Austrian immigrants. And we really get to know the Austrian grandparents real well, especially the grandmother. She has folk traditions that she shares. Um, she's wise. She, she functions the way that the grandparents do in the other Irish uh, American novels that I write about here. But the Irish grandparents get very quickly dismissed as just producing this very, um, <sighs> this, this strain that's going to die out, essentially. So um, obviously, I find problems with the book for those reasons. People love this book. And when I, hear, when I say to people, um, you know, I write about Irish American literature, they say, have you read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn? I love that book. And I feel bad because I don't feel the same way, except the best thing I'll say about it, I think, is that that idea of class migration that I talked about a few minutes ago, that's what this book does really well. It's really a multi-ethnic, a story of a multi-ethnic neighborhood. Half of the protagonist's family is Irish. Um, but she's got Austrian grandparents and Jewish neighbors. And um, it's a great book about what it would mean to grow up and out of um, an impoverished multi-ethnic neighborhood. My title for that chapter is <laughs> Why and Why Not? Why should this book be in this, my book and why not? Let me say it the right way. Uh, oh, I'm losing my spot, sorry. Oh, maybe I won't get to the right title. But anyway, it's, it's something to do with <laughs> on why this book should and should not be starting a book on Irish American literature. Sorry. Um, then we get into the ones that, I, that are, uh, I think, more appropriate. This, this book is probably the one that started my whole uh, project, really. Our Own Kind by Edward McSorley. McSorley's from Providence. Rhode Island, and his book is set in Providence in um, a very Irish American uh, community in South Providence. Specific neighborhood, very vividly brought to life. Um, and this is one of the first ones where we see this, this Irish immigrant grandfather character, Ned, Ned uh, McDermott, who's a wonderful character. Um, and he's got flaws. He drinks a little bit too, but not, it's not his defining feature, right? He's a hard worker. He works until the day he dies, and uh, he's generous, and he's kind, and he's funny. He's got more going on <laughs> than just drinking, which is, I think, what you see in the books that are written um, by most of these, these authors. It's not so simple as uh, the Johnny Nolan story. McSorley wrote a couple follow-ups to the, um, our Own Kind, The Young McDermott, and Kitty, I Hardly Knew You. Uh, he is very well versed in what's happening in Ireland at the time when he's, when he's writing, or the decades leading up to his writing. A lot of Irish American authors don't tend to talk about the Civil War in Ireland, for instance, but um, McSorley does. He, he's more in tune with what's what's going on, though he is Irish-American, Providence-born himself. Um, but the, the grandfather, Ned, I mentioned, the grandson, Willie, is the protagonist of the first book and the second book. Uh, the young McDermott is Willie. And he's having to come of age at a time when his grandfather's not going to be there for him anymore. And he has to figure out how to negotiate this American life himself. Um, and he realizes in getting educated that he's probably be going to become a stranger to his neighborhood. Um, so that is a common theme with the uh, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn as well. The next book I write about is Moon Gaffney by Har Harry Sylvester, who um, 
this is a New York set book. Uh, Harry Sylvester, he really takes on the Catholic Church. This one has a slightly different tilt to it. Um, he takes on a Catholic Church that seems to be, in his point of view, <laughs> mostly interested in filling the collection plate uh, and not in helping the poor. So he, he puts that up against, actually, uh, Dorothy Day is a character in the, the book. Um, the, is she sainted yet? She, she sh should be if she's not. Um, but she, her Catholic worker house, uh, it's a shelter, they, they feed the poor and so on. And Harry, uh, Moon Gaffney, who's the protagonist, realizes this is where the real work of, of the church is, is happening instead of in the archbishop's office, you know, um, who are making real estate deals and, and so on. So it is, though, most of those names of the higher ups, the clergy, of anybody in the clergy are, are Irish names. And all of Moon Gaffney's neighbors are Irish Americans who have, at this point, through the, uh, the Tammany political machine in New York, they have gotten to very comfortable upper middle class, I would say, and are forgetting kind of their roots, as we talked about earlier. Uh, Mary Doyle Carn, I know I talked about this book when I was here before, The Parish and the Hill, the wonderful book set in Holyoke, Massachusetts, uh, Milltown, and where, where Curran grew up. And um, she invented this benevolent Irish immigrant grandfather character for, uh, for the novel as well, who lectures. Um, he's also fun, great storyteller, and all of the above. But uh, when people come to him, a young politician, for instance, comes to him and says, oh, we need your support, um, Johnny, Johnny O'Sullivan, we need your support because we need these Polish people are trying to take our jobs and we need, you know, we need to keep them out of the mill. And by the way, they barely speak English and Johnny's a native Irish speaker and he yells <laughs> at them, like since when does an Irish person, uh, is an Irish person proud? Of, of English as a language, you know, it's, it's that conscience the, the immigrant grandfather characters seem to provide. Uh, but of course, without spoiling every single book for you, their generation is dying out and that does seem to happen in novels as well. So the young protagonist who's about the age that the author would be is left to kind of figure out how to negotiate this, this country without their grandfathers. Next one I cover is Lace Curtain by Ellen Berlin. And this, I think I talked about this one here as well. Berlin, I hate to introduce her this way, but it's like, it's how she would have been introduced. She's Irving Berlin's wife, <laughs> the songwriter. And she's also the granddaughter of um, a millionaire who she's the, an heiress because her grandfather, who was an Irish immigrant, came over and hit uh, silver in the Comstock load in Nevada. So she um, is a beneficiary of, of that money, well invested in international telegraph and all this stuff. And uh, so she writes about not the Irish uh, working class, but the upper, upper class. And um, you know, they're hanging out with the Vanderbilts and, and those folks. But the protagonist in this one feels like she's still discriminated against in those highest up circles of New York social life. They're still not quite accepting. Some of the characters feel like the Irish um, are the, the servant class still, and they let her know about it often in the novel. Uh, but again, in this one, you've got another Irish grandfather because his grandkids are talking poorly about um, a Jewish guest of his. his. His law partner actually is at dinner. After dinner, the grandkids say, we wish we didn't have to eat with him, you know? And the grandfather, Mr. O'Shea, overhears and tells them, you know, I didn't, I wasn't born in a castle in Dublin. <laughs> I wasn't born in Dublin Castle. I was born in a shanty if you're going to be looking 
to uh, look down on anybody. Remember where you came from. Um, and that's one point to make both about Sylvester's Moon Gaffney and um, Lace Curtain, but also in, in McSorley's Our Own Kind, one of the groups that the Irish are discriminating against in those novels are um, Jewish people. And you think about the timing of these books, they're just after World War II. These authors and everybody else has just seen the atrocities that happened in the Holocaust. And of course they'd be worried if they saw their peers um, expressing the same kind of anti-Semitic views that just call, cause this horrible, um, unthinkable mass uh, death. Berlin's husband, Irving Berlin, is Jewish and had um, come out of uh, extreme poverty in, in Russia or Russia occupied Poland, I forget, as a child and to make it up to be this extremely successful, um, wealthy American, but she's still worried about her own kids. And she did worry in real life um, about what if Germany made it across the Atlantic, what would happen to her own kids. So she weaves that into um, the story as well. There's some very nasty anti-Semitic characters and, and rhetoric that the protagonist is always on the other side of that, trying to combat that. Uh, and finally, this one might be a surprise. <laughs> uh, John Steinbeck in a book about Irish American authors, but Steinbeck's maternal grandparents were both from Ireland, turns out. Um, his, his father obviously wasn't. Steinbeck would be a German name, but his in East of Eden, most of the book is about other characters, but there's a subplot in the book that's about Sam Hamilton. And Sam Hamilton is the name of John Steinbeck's maternal grandfather, his beloved maternal grandfather, who again, when I discovered this, I didn't discover it, it's been known. <laughs> but when I read about, I read an article about Steinbeck going back to Ireland to try to find his family cottage in uh, Derry. And I thought, and it talks about how he fictionalized his grandfather. I thought, I have to read this book because it sounds just like what I'm reading. Mo everything else I wrote about is on this side of the country. But East of Eden um, is set where, mostly where Steinbeck grew up, which is in California in the uh, Salinas Valley. But again, <laughs> it fits the way the grandfather is. He doesn't lecture the younger ones so much, but just in the way he acts. He's an open person. He befriends a, a Chinese-American character who nobody else knows <laughs> that Lee, this other character, he speaks perfect English because he was born here and went to university here. Lee puts on an accent for everybody else because he says, you know, most Americans don't see him and think he'd be able to speak um, intelligent and clear English. But Sam does. Sam is... is someone who um, doesn't prejudge people. He sees, he sees value in everybody and he learns a lot from Lee and they become, they become good friends. Um, but again, like in all of these novels, you have kind of the, the future generations. One of Sam's kids ends up working, making loads of money for um, selling cars for Hen Henry Ford, basically. And, uh, He, he thinks, he looks down upon Sam's creativity and generosity and um, thinks that, you know, if he were just less open like that, then he would have been able to make money. He wouldn't have been poor all his life or, or kept the family poor and so on. Um, so there's a lot more to that book, <laughs> but I write about the, the subplot, which is about the Hamilton family. And Edwin O'Connor, The Last Hurrah. This is the one I mentioned. He's the guy who was friends with John Kelleher, who was the uh, Celtic Studies uh, professor at Harvard, who said there was no such thing as Irish American literature. But this book answers it. And actually, Kelleher ended up writing a really nice um, um, memorial 
kind of a eulogy, but published form for, for O'Connor. That's, uh, there's a collection of Kelleher's essays, which are really good. Just a thoughtful guy. Um, so he eulogizes his friend and says basically that he did write the, uh, the Irish American novel. You may have heard of this one. This one was made into a movie back when. Um, and it tells the story of a politician who's very, very much suspiciously like um, James Michael Curley from Boston and his last um, political campaign. Curley was mayor of Boston many, many times and was governor of Massachusetts once, I believe. And same with Frank Skeffington, who's the character in the book. Frank doesn't have grandkids, but he has a nephew who he takes under his wing in this book. A lot of people have written about the political side of this book and what it means. Um, you know, they've written about O'Connor as someone who writes about priests and politicians and public life of a middle class or above Irish American, which is true. But my take on this one is that it's also a very private. Um, Frank Skeffington wants to pass on his family stories to his nephew before he dies. And he wants to pass on not only the family stories, but the story of his Boston Irish community where he grew up because those people are dying off. It's um, made very clear in this book as well. Oh yeah. Um, the last time I did this presentation, I had some Woonsocket folks in the, in the audience. He was born in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. He, does, he writes about Boston, but in, uh, he doesn't always call it Boston, but it's very much, he settled in Boston, and you can tell it is. Uh, there. The Edge of Sadness is a wonderful novel about a, a priest, an Irish priest, Irish Catholic, uh, Irish American priest, I should say. Um, and that is really the, the bulk of, of my thing. I, I, I'll read just a little bit from my conclusion, and then if you have questions, I'm glad to, to answer any. Um, so, in addition to trying to preserve something of the Irish American past as they imagined and sometimes idealized it, these authors grapple with the Irish American present and even offer warnings about its future. Writing in the post-World War II era in the wake of one of the most heinous displays of bigotry in human history, these authors are all too aware of the dangers of ethnocentric thinking for these deep thinkers, it must have been a time of questioning what kind of world they lived in and what kind of world they wanted to live in. Looking around them locally, they see people who had attained a small amount of power beginning to turn that against those who did not. They see anti-Semitic, anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-poor feelings repeating the abuses their own families faced just a couple generations back. They see the hypocrisy and the harm of those in those attitudes and they call them out in their novels. Um, so that's really the, that's the focus or the thread that I find through, through all of these books that I write about. And that's, it was the main argument of my book. I'm glad to, to answer any questions if you have any or take any comments that you have. In 1920, when they did the, uh, when the U.S. did that immigration, uh, I don't know if it was a block or whatever. Do you think it was related to prohibition in some way? I don't know if it was related to prohibition. I, what I've read about it is it was more related to these kinds of fears about the kinds of people who were coming into the country, uh, including anarchists and, um, and other folks who might um, disrupt the American way, basically. It seemed to be, a, you know, we go through these cycles, right, where depending on who's what the administration is uh, kind of clamping down on. It happens too often, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so I mean, it did. It slowed the Irish immigration as well as as all immigration at that point. Um, whereas it, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I've read in places like going back um, into the 19th century anyway, when people say, "Oh, they." My, my ancestors weren't illegal immigrants. Well, nobody was because there weren't these immigration laws yet until, until later, until they put those in place. So 
Uh, it was kind of a, uh, the floodgates were open for a while, and then in the 20s, they, they got very much, very restricted. Uh, it did change the makeup of these, um, these neighborhoods eventually. Any other? You call some of the um, titles from your last talk. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I finally pulled them all together have them all in one spot and uh, try to pull together the history, the memory studies, some uh, post-colonial theory, which I didn't touch on too much today, and then the novels themselves. And there are a lot of spoilers in here. <laughs> um, I, would, I, I would advocate for everybody to go look up the novels. I think uh, Margaret's probably got some here in the library or some that you could get through um, other libraries in the system as well. There are some great books. The last hurrah. I've, I've come to the conclusion that Edwin O'Connor, The Last Hurrah and The Edge of Sadness, he's my favorite writer out of all of these. I looked at them you know, from a scholarly perspective, but to the ones I would want to sit down and read again and again, when I read The Last Hurrah, I, seriously, I laugh and I cry. Like it's, it's, it's so well, well written, well done. Um, so if you were to recommend a novel for us to read, that would be the one? That would be probably the one I would start with. And then the other one that does really what I'm talking about here the most is Our Own Kind, the Edward McSorley book. That one's a little harder to come by, I think. But The Last Hurrah, because it was made into a movie, O'Connor was quite popular for, for a while, uh, should be around more, more easily. The Edge of Sadness, also by O'Connor, is a, just a beautiful book, uh, which takes on, I didn't write about it as much in here, but it. Um, actually, the copy of The Last Hurrah I have is bound together with The Edge of Sadness. So um, both of those are really, really good. What was the other one? Um, Our Own Kind. Right. Yeah, Edward McSorley. Well, I thank you all so much for, for being here and listening to me. I, do, I have a couple copies of the book, but as I mentioned um, earlier, Mar Margaret's got it uh, ordered for the library here. Because it's from an academic press, or it's not a university press, but Paul, Paul Gray Macmillan does academic books, they price it so that only university libraries can afford it, unfortunately. So I hate to even offer it, but I do have a couple copies. I did get to buy some at 50% off, which brings it down to the low, low price, price of $60. So yeah, I know, that's what I'm saying. So I encourage you to check it out from the library, uh, unless you want a copy. We could, we could talk after. Um, but thanks so much for, for being here and for listening and for, thank you, thank you Margaret. For coming this evening and for presenting to us um, because I think my takeaway from it is, is that even though all this is a well uh, proselytized situation where people are always sort of suspect of the latest in immigrants and mm -hmm. whatever, that even with that kind of knowledge, we're still making the same mistakes and that is the real tragedy that it's well documented and yet all we're here doing is just not not seeing the potential for the enrichment and for new community making and uh, mm -hmm. new friends exactly yeah absolutely but thank you very much for coming tonight and for presenting to us and uh, we look forward to reading these books and uh, thank you for uh, highlighting them to us you're welcome thank you for having me Welcome.